So very good. Shall we start? Yes. So so welcome everybody to this uh, another uh, seminar in this seminar series of complex systems organized by uh, the area of complex systems at Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana. Today we have uh, the pleasure to have a very good uh, colleague and, uh, and friend of us, Hugo Touchet. So I'm going to very briefly introduce him. So Hugo is originally from uh, Montreal, from Canada. He did his uh, bachelor thesis at uh, at the Department of Physics at the University of Sherbrooke in Canada. Then he did a master, uh, that was from 94 to 97. That he, then he did a master in science in MIT under the supervision of uh, Professor uh, Seth Lloyd from 19 to 2000. Uh, after that, he did a PhD at McGill, McGill University from 2000 to 2003. Then a postdoctoral fellowship at Queen Mary London for two years. After that, from uh, 2006 to 2012, he he was he became lecturer in applied mathematics at Queen Mary, and from 2012 and 13, he became senior senior lecturer also at the same university, the Queen Mary University of London in UK, which is more or less when uh, we overlap when uh, I was there. Okay, yeah. although uh, actually maybe you don't remember, but also we uh, we crossed paths in you know events like a uh, summer schools in a uh, in uh, in Belgium at some point in Leuven. Um, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Might, have been, might have been the first time. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Yeah, then, yeah, yeah, yeah. then he uh, decided to, to move uh, to South Africa. Uh, he was first from 2013 until 2019 at the National Institute for Theoretical Physics at the Stellen, Stellen Bosch in South Africa. And from September of 2018 until now, he's professor of, of applied mathematics in the Department of Mathematical Science at, at Stellenbosch University, okay, in South Africa. So Hugo Touchet, thank you very much, okay, for agreeing to give a seminar. It's really a pleasure to, uh, to be, that you accepted. You know, you, you do a fantastic work in, in large deviations. So please go ahead, uh, we are all yours. Okay, good, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, I followed some of the talks before that were scheduled this year, and uh, I, I think this is a, a great project of Isaac actually to have these seminars. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna give the talk in in Spanish, unfortunately. My Spanish is too limited for this, so it's gonna be in English. I'll start sharing my screen just now, and uh, good. I'll just cut the video because the um, the bandwidth is not so great in South Africa. And Isaac, can you confirm that you see the slide then? Yes, we see the slides. Please go ahead. Good. Okay. So the, what I want to, to do in the talk is to give a, an introduction to large deviation theory, which is a, a subfield of probability theory in, in mathematics, and to explain how that mathematical theory um, is applied in statistical physics for studying equilibrium system, complex systems, non-equilibrium systems. And I want to give also a, a taste of how it emerged historically from maths, but also from physics historically, and how the two subjects um, just created that theory with some interactions between the two. Um, yeah. So, large deviation theory is concerned with probabilities, and then we'll see this is the, 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 the main theme, like the undercurrent of the theory, is probabilities that have an exponential form. In fact, probabilities that decay exponentially with some parameters. So all the probabilities that we'll be dealing will deal with large systems, so n will be the number of particles or the volume, but it doesn't have to be that parameter. So there is a large parameter somewhere, and then we take that parameter to be very large, and then we look at some approximations for the probability, and then what we see is that probabilities in many, many cases decay exponentially with that parameter, and then we, there's an exponent there that determines how quickly it goes down. And so that kind of probability was discovered in mathematics for the first time by Kramer in 1938 in the context of sums of random variables, and I'll, I'll explain the history of this and how it came about. But actually, if you look at history and try to find the first large deviation result, it comes from physics. It comes from a calculation by Boltzmann, which I'll, I'll show, which is very well known, in fact, in equilibrium statistical mechanics. The root of the subject is from physics, but never really made a connection over to mathematics until mathematicians started being interested in the subject. And what's interesting is that 
after it was sort of created in physics and then created independently in large deviation theory, then people in the 50s and the 60s started realizing, oh, there's a connection and started working on that connection and then using the, the mathematical language for studying other types of systems. So equilibrium, but also non-equilibrium systems. And this is what I want to mention during the talk. And what's nice for, for physicists is that you have a, a mathematical theory that gives a structure, a language, an easy language, I would claim, to study equilibrium and non-equilibrium system. And moreover, you kind of show that the two theories, equilibrium and non-equilibrium, have the same structure. They have the structure of large deviations, and that, that's very useful for guiding us in understanding now doing work on non-equilibrium system. And I hope to give some ideas of that too. So I'll start with the history with that result of Boltzmann that I mentioned. This is from his paper of 1877, which is the paper on the statistical interpretation of entropy. So this is the first paper. This is the paper that introduced the P log P entropy that we know now today, which was also discovered or used by Shannon for uh, founding information theory. So the basic problem that Boltzmann considered is the perfect gas. So you have n particles. And then he wants to count the number of configurations, microstates, that lead to a given energy distribution. So this is the system. Now, if you, if you specify for each particle which energy it has, and so Boltzmann actually starts assuming that each particle can take on a discrete value of the energy, and that's well before quantum mechanics. So that, this is extraordinary, but this is for the for him, it was a simplification in the calculation. So each particle can take an energy which is discrete. And if you specify for each particle what the energy of the particle is, you're specifying the microscopic configuration. So you specifying the microstate. And from Boltzmann, we know that this is not really what we want to do. We don't really have access to the microstate. So what we want to do instead is to look at a macro state, so something that we measure macroscopically, and then we have to count the number of configurations that are consistent with some experimental value or just measurement of the macro state. So here the macro state is the energy distribution. You count the number of particles in each energy level. So instead of specifying the energy level per particle, you just look at the energy levels and then you just count the number of particles. So this is the histogram of the energies in a given system. This is a random quantity. If the system evolves in time, then the histogram will change also in time in some random way. So what you want to calculate is the probability to see a given energy distribution, a given energy histogram. Now to do that calculation, you, you follow Boltzmann. So you have to count the number of configurations that are uh, consistent with a given energy distribution. And that's related to the multinomial distribution. So here you have the multinomial combinatorial factor. It's an exact factor, but if you take the log of this, you see that it scales linearly if you use the Stirling approximation. So you can approximate the log of the combinatorial factor. And this is where you discover that the combinatorial factor after taking the Stirling approximation gives you that P log P entropy. So it means that because now all distribution with a fixed energy have the same probability, this is the equiprobability postulate, it means that the probability of seeing a given energy distribution goes down exponentially with the number of particles and the exponent that determines the speed at which it goes to zero is the entropy of the histogram, the energy histogram. So this is, this is a fantastic result, it's really a combinatorial result by doing some asymptotics. And here I'm showing the part of uh, Boltzmann paper where you can see it. So this is M is the entropy, it's the P log P, so you see W, L, L is the log for Boltzmann. And so you see that sum of W log W entropy. This is the number of particle constraint, the number of particles has to be fixed to M, and this is the energy constraint. The first energy times the number of particles in that level, the second energy times the number of particles in that level has to be fixed too. So Boltzmann maximizes the entropy on these constraints. And this, so this is the maximum entropy calculation for the perfect gas. So first result where you see historically a probability that is approximately exponential, that's the dominant term. And that's what we'll see coming um, time after time. Now, this is very specific to the perfect gas. So now if you look in the, the history of, of the subject, there's a generalization coming from, Bolt, uh, from Einstein in 1910, 
who wants to generalize Boltzmann's idea that probabilities are exponential with the entropy, but now he wants to apply this to real system where you cannot do the counting. So you cannot apply combinatorics to count the number of states consistent with some macrostate value. So now Einstein considers a real system, maybe with interaction, so not a perfect gas, maybe even a liquid. And then as before, you look at some macrostate, which is a function of the microscopic configuration. And again, following Boltzmann, what you have to do is to calculate the density of state. So that's the number of microscopic, microscopic configurations that lead to a given value of the macrostate. Now here you cannot do the combinatorics if you're dealing with real systems. So what Einstein did instead is to postulate that the density of state will be exponential with the physical entropy of the system expressed as a function of the macro state. So this is a postulate. So if you do this, essentially you're postulating that all probabilities in thermodynamics or statistical mechanics will have an exponential form. And what you need to, so this is a postulate, so you basically raise this to say that entropy is really related to counting in statistical mechanics. And if you do, if you put this as a postulate, essentially what Einstein showed is that you recover the whole of thermodynamics and much of statistical mechanics. In particular, if the probabilities is given by the entropy, then the most probable macro state, the equilibrium state, will be the one that maximizes the entropy. So we we knew that at the time. Moreover, if you do uh, Gaussian expansions of the entropy, you recover a lot of thermodynamic results um, like uh, uh, the, the heat capacity formula and things like this. So this seems to be the good starting point and the foundational point actually to base thermodynamics on. This is the part of the paper where you see this, you have the density of state, it's up to a constant, some exponential with the uh, uh, the, the gas constant times the entropy, and so this is the physical postulate. Now at that point, so here now you see that the idea that probabilities are exponential starts showing up. Um, and just checking now, Isaac, you're still listening to me because I've just lost um, some the, the screen for the, the cameras. Yes. Uh, yeah, you just muted, but yeah, I see that you're speaking. Good, good, thank you. Just checking that I'm not talking in the void. Sometimes the connection can fall down. So at this point now, probabilities are exponential. They're postulated to be exponential, or you can show that with using combinatorics, but there's no, there's no mathematics. At that point, I don't think that physicists thought that this had to go beyond just mere physics, that, it was, it, 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 that there was a more general structure behind this that was related to mathematics. Hey, oh, 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 can I? Can I ask, uh, can I take the opportunity to ask you a question? Yes. Yeah, uh, so, 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 uh, so normally large deviation theory is based on the fact that the probabilities are the case exponentially, okay? Yeah. But I guess that uh, you can generalize this thing uh, in situations where uh, the decay is supersponential uh, or, uh, or maybe you can generalize it to, to the case of generalized statistics. Uh, this has been studied. Is it is interesting? Mm. Not, not interesting. I mentioned a few words about this actually when we when I go into the theory and then some of the applications. Okay. No, I a few things. So, I mean, so a short answer to your question is that large deviation theory is not a universal theory, and so there are cases where you wouldn't have a large deviation form where probabilities won't be exponential. And I'll mention a few examples, but of this. Now, going back to the history, now the first result that I mentioned related to this in mathematics is from Kammer. So this is 1938. This is a paper in French coming from a conference. This is the picture of Adolf Kramer, where he considered a, a sum of independent random variables divided by n. So this is a sample mean, and he wants to find the distribution of that sample mean. So this is quite a, an important problem in probability theory. And the reason for Kramer to look at this problem was that he was very involved in doing consultancy work for insurance companies. So you have to imagine that the sum, the random sum, is a sum of random claims. And so you want the distribution to actually fix the price that you should charge for policies in order to cover yourself for the risk of receiving random claims. Now, at the time, the dominant result in probability theory was a central limit theorem, but Kramer wanted to go beyond this because he really wanted information about the tail of the distribution of the sample mean. And so what he showed is that the probability actually goes exponential, uh, exponentially with 
the, the number of random variables, so it decays exponentially with the number of random variables, and he was able to find a sort of all the corrections that are related to this, and as you can see, all the corrections are sub-exponential. So the exponentially decaying form is really the dominant form of the probability. If you know that part, basically you know everything about the distribution because it's so dominant with all the corrections. And he showed that you have this exponential form, and moreover, the exponent that we call the rate function, sometimes it's called the Kramer function, that rate function is the Legendre transform of the cumulant of the random variable in the random sum. So there's a connection here now with Legendre transform, which we'll see is very important for thermodynamics. Now, this was the first result in mathematics. If you talk to mathematicians about large deviation theory, they'll say that the first large deviation result is from Kramer because they're not aware of that calculation from Boltzmann. Now, if you look at mathematics again and then you follow history, nothing was done for a very long time until 1957, work by Sanov, a Russian mathematician, who considered a problem very similar to Boltzmann. You consider a sequence of independent random variables, they all have the same distribution, they're independent, and, and just to fix the ideas clear, just imagine that the random variables are binary, so they're zero or one, and so you have a bunch of random zero, a bunch of random ones, and then even for the sake of the example, just the same probability, one half, so you just throw random bits as a sequence. Now you can look at the number of zeros in a sequence and the number of ones in a sequence. And this will be, this is what we call the empirical distribution, but this is the histogram that Boltzmann was looking at. For a given sequence, you just count the number of zeros, you normalize, this is your fraction of zeros, you calculate the number of ones, this is the fraction of ones, and so this is a random vector. If you throw another sequence of random bits, you get a different histogram. So you have a probability of getting only zeros or a probability of getting only ones or as you can imagine, the, the sequences with the same fractions of zeros and ones will be more probable, and so you want to calculate the probability of seeing a given fractions of zeros and ones. And what Sanov showed is that that probability decays exponentially, and then the exponent is the relative entropy. And in fact, he derived that result pretty much in the same way as Boltzmann did, because he started from the multinomial distribution, applied um, Stirling's approximation and just obtain the relative entropy just like the, 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 the Shannon entropy there. So you see that everything goes exponentially except where the rate function is zero. It's zero when the fraction is equal to the distribution used for generating the random sequence. So here you have the large, large number. The most probable empirical distribution is actually P, which makes sense. This is this is a when you read this paper, it's it's very bizarre. Actually, when you read Russian papers, sometimes it's bizarre. You have an impression that time machine exists because they, they seem so ahead of their time. But here it's bizarre because there's really no mention of Boltzmann, even though all the techniques are straight out of the Boltzmann uh, paper, 1877, but that's like 80 years after. Moreover, what's very surprising about this paper is that Sanov starts first with discrete random variables, and then he finishes with continuous random variables, and then he says, well, you can deal with continuous random variables by just discretizing them, and then you take the continuum limit of the discrete result, which is exactly what Boltzmann does in his paper. It, the real problem that Boltzmann wanted to study is the perfect gas with real energies, but it discretized them to do the combinatorics and then take a continuum limit to get the P log P as an integral entropy, which is exactly, again, what Sanov does. This paper of Sanov is the only probability paper that he has. He was more known, actually, as someone working in number theory, so I, I don't know the full history or the full connection as to how he, he got to this problem and why there was no mention of Boltzmann or why nobody uh, mentioned to him that the problem had some similarities with some calculation in, in physics. But now, of course, with hindsight, we know that we have that connection. Okay, so, so, so now we have this idea again showing again that probabilities can be exponential with the number of random variables or the number of particles. And so at that point, there was a bit of silence historically up to the 60s and the 70s where the theory was put on a general footing and then it was shown that it really goes beyond independent random variables and then you can, you can get probabilities that have the same form for Markov processes. And this is really the start of large deviation theory. So at this point, I'll just um, stop at the history and I'll just want to present very briefly what's the, the, the basic results of the theory and how it's framed in modern language. So 
Um, large division theory starts very generally now with you have a stochastic system where you have a collection of random variables, but you, you're going to have some probabilistic model underlying your, 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 your study. But what's interesting or what's the interest really is on some random variable, which I'm going to denote here by AN. So this is really a family or a sequence of random variable because it's parameterized or indexed by some n, and then n will go to infinity. So this could be the number of random variable in a sum, the number of particles for the energy or, or whatever. So what you, the meaning of that n really will depend on what you study. So we have that random variable and we want to calculate or find uh, the, the probability distribution of that random variable. So either a discrete probability distribution for discrete random variable or probability density for a continuous random variable. Now, what we expect is that that distribution will decay exponentially with that parameter n. So we, we take as a, as a starting point a definition, which is basically a definition of that approximation. And we call this the large deviation principle. So this is just a definition. We say that the distribution satisfies a large deviation principle or has the form of a large deviation approximation if it decays approximately with n exponentially and with with some exponent that we'll call the rate function. Now, this is a very intuitive way of presenting large deviation theory. If you read mathematics, it's a lot more complicated because you have to explain what you mean by approximately exponential. And so you have to specify the meaning of the approximation sign. What this means in a nutshell is that if you take the log, then the dominant contribution of the log of the probability is n times something. And then you might have some corrections, but these corrections are sublinear with n that parameter. So it means that if you divide by n the two sides and you take the limit, then the corrections will actually go away. And so you're left only with the exponent of the exponential, which we call the rate function. You can show that that rate function is positive. It has, it can, it has at least one zero, it can have more, but that rate function is positive. So if the limit exists, we say that the probability satisfies the large deviation principle. And again, this is just a definition. Now, so you see the probability itself is not exactly exponential. And then the point is that it's very difficult, if not impossible, to get the exact distribution. But to some extent, we don't care about this exact distribution because if we can show that it has a large deviation principle, then we really have the dominant part of that distribution. And this is the fundamental idea. The corrections to that exponential are sublinear in the exponent. And so they're very small compared to the information that we already have with the rate function. Now with this, the goal is in large deviation theory is that for a given random variable, you want to show that its distribution has a large deviation principle. And really the real object that you want to calculate is the rate function. When you have the rate function, then you know pretty much what the distribution looks like. And the kind of picture, general picture that, we, that we're gonna have is this picture that I show on the right here. You have the distribution, but here the distribution is really kind of shown via the rate function, which I'm putting in red. So the rate function is positive and it has one zero. When the rate function is positive, it means that the distribution decays exponentially. So if you consider larger and larger n, the distribution is just smaller. In fact, exponentially smaller each time. And so it has to concentrate where the distribution does not decay exponentially and that will be the zero. So when you have a zero for the rate function, this will correspond to a concentration point where the probability will increase essentially exponentially as n goes to infinity. So these points are very important. They're basically like the law of large number that corresponds to equilibrium states or stationary states. And then around those con concentration points, you have exponentially small probability and the shape of the distribution is more or less given by the shape of the rate function. And so that, that these are the general ideas. Now, how do we get the rate function? So there are many results in large deviation theory. I won't have, I don't have the time to go over all of them. So I'll just present one result, which in a way is the main result that we use in physics to get rate function. And the idea of this result is that instead of dealing directly with the distribution, you try to deal with the Fourier transform or the Laplace transform. And the result goes as follows. It's known as the gartner ellis theorem. So what you do is that you try to calculate this function that we call the scale cumulant generating function. 
Now, an is the random variable that you're interested to study. You try to you calculate the generating function. That's this expectation. That's just the Laplace transform of the random variable. You take the log. The log means that you're looking at the cumulant. And because you have a limit, this is known as the scale cumulant generating function. What the theorem says is that if this function can be calculated, if it's it exists and it's differentiable, then you know that the random variable has a large deviation principle. And moreover, you have the rate function. The rate function is given by the Legendre transform of that lambda k. Now, the way I put the Legendre transform, it's not obviously like maybe the form that you know the Legendre transform to be, to be in, but this is really a Legendre transform. If it's slightly more general, it's, it's called a Legendre Fenkel transform, but it's essentially a Legendre transform. So there's a duality between this function lambda k and the rate function, and that duality is related to the Legendre transform. So it's very useful. In particular, if you know that you have these conditions in the theorem, you can calculate the rate function, then you know that the rate function will be convex because a Legendre transform always gives you convex function. But that's just a, a side uh, gain when you apply this theorem. Uh, the theorem actually dates back from Gartner in 77, and then Elias, Richard Elias, um, just make the, the theorem stronger by just weakening the conditions for applying it. So the version I'm actually given here with lambda k being differentiable is from Gartner. If you want something a bit more technical, then you would read Ellis, but that's the essence of it. So we use this result quite a lot in physics to get rate function. And here I'm just going to apply this in the simplest case, go back to the case that Kramer considered, which is the case of sums of random variables that are independent, independent and ident identically distributed. So the same sample mean, you have a sum of random variables, they all have the same distribution, but they're independent. In this case, what you do is that you look at the definition of the scale cumulative generating functions because you're dealing with independent random variables, then the generating function uh, factorizes and because of the log, you actually can take the limit exactly and then you get the cumulant. So now here, the rate function will be the Legendre transform of the cumulant, and this is Kramer's result. So Kramer's result is really, in a way, now seen as a particular case of the gartner elias theorem when you're dealing with independent random variables. So here you can, you can start playing um, uh, the game now. You, you consider specific sums. So for instance, if you have a sum of Gaussian, what's the distribution? What's the rate function? Well, you calculate the cumulant. The cumulant is a parabola that's differentiable. You can take the Legendre transform. The Legendre transform of a parabola is a parabola. And so you get this rate function. And this shows that the rate function is quadratic. So it means that the distribution is essentially a Gaussian. This is known as sum of Gaussian is Gaussian. So here you just recover stuff that's already known. The zero of the rate function is the mean because the sample mean converges to the mean with probability one. That's the concentration effect that's predicted by large deviation theory. Now here, this is a bit trivial because the rate function itself is fully quadratic. So you're dealing with Gaussian fluctuations. What's more interesting is that you take a case where you have say a sum of exponential, you can calculate lambda k again. Now it's not a parabola, but it's differentiable. You can Legendre transform this and then you get this rate function. So here I'm showing the rate function. It's not a parabola, it's more interesting. It has a zero, it's the mean again, that's the log large number. The sample mean converges to the mean in probability. So that's the concentration effect. Close to the mean, you can expand this to second order. You'll see Gaussian fluctuations around the concentration point. That's essentially the central limit theorem. But now large deviation theory gives you shows that away from the mean, you don't have Gaussian fluctuations because the rate function has a weird shape. And from that shape, you can actually get some statistics or some information about the, the tails of the distribution. And this is exactly what you would want to get. So for instance, here, the rate function is asymptotically linear in the positive tail. So that means that the large fluctuations of the sum for an exponential is exponential too. So this is uh, useful information. Now, here I can now come back to um, Isaac's question. What happens if I have other random variables and random variables, for instance, for which I'm not expecting the distribution to be exponential? So for instance, you can take a sum of Cauchy random variables. In this case, we know the distribution is not exponential. It's actually Cauchy 2. So what's going to happen here? What happens is that if you try to calculate the cumulant, you get infinity. So Cauchy doesn't have moments, so it doesn't have a generating function. So in this case, it just doesn't apply. In a way, large deviation theory would fail for that case. And if so here, it, it makes sense because the distribution 
for the sum is a power law. So if you try to actually get this onto an exponential scale, you'll get that the rate function is zero everywhere. It's just not the right scale to study the distribution. And in this case, I, to my knowledge, there's no generalization to capture what the asymptotics of the distribution would be. Of course, the sum of Cauchy is exactly Cauchy, so you don't need any asymptotics here. But it's the same if the distribution was super exponential or sub exponential. If you try to fit it or see it on the exponential scale, you will get infinity or zero for the rate function. So it just shows that in this case, large deviation theory does not give meaningful information. The rate function is just trivial, and so the distribution is not exponential. Uh, Hugo, but in that case, uh, can I, cannot I simply generalize and, and use a deformation of the exponential that depends on a parameter, and, as, and I simply look for the value of the parameter that deforms the exponential such that the limit is non-trivial, or this doesn't work either? No, it doesn't work here because you also lose the duality and all the exponential structure. What's nice about the exponential is that then you have the saddle point approximation, which is the really the, 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 the basis for that Legendre duality. Now, people like Salis will tell you that there is a generalization, but it's, it's uh -huh. just been disproved over and over again. It's just... I see. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, Very okay. Good. okay. Um, so it's, it's, it's an open problem, I would say, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that there's no hope of doing anything, but, you know, it's meaningful work on this is, is, is not much. Okay. Now, the theory is, is useful, of course, because it, it goes beyond independent random variables. And so much of the work that actually uh, established that theory as a theory came because people showed that you can apply this to Markov processes in a very interesting way and then you get also distributions that decay exponentially with some parameters. And if you if you look at the work in Markov processes, you have two lines of work. You have um, what we call the low noise theory, which in the math side actually was done by Freiden and Benzel, but it, it, you can also see this in physics uh, in works of, of Zagreb. So you take a, a differential equation, you put the differential equation by a small Gaussian noise. And so here, the, 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 the large deviation parameter is the noise amplitude that goes to zero. So here you have concentration around the deterministic behavior given by the differential equation. For a small enough noise, the probability of the trajectories themselves will decay exponentially with some action. And the large parameter here will be one over the noise amplitude. So this is the basis of many things in physics. It's been worked out also on the physics side alone, say, by when you look at work by Kramer on the escape problem, then you see this. When you look at works by Anzager, you see this. So this is the basis of transition path theory um, uh, by stability and thermal activation. Um, but on the math side, it was worked out in the 70s by the, these two mathematicians, Russian mathematicians, Khalil and Benzel. There's also another line of research for Markov processes, which has to do with uh, more related to these sums of random variables. Instead of looking at sums of random variables, you look at integral of functions of the process. So you have a Markov process, and you can imagine now that the observable is an integral of some function of the process. In many, many cases, you can show that the distribution also decays exponentially, and now the large deviation parameter is the integration time. So you take time going to infinity, and that's the ergodic limit. And this has been used a lot in physics to study non-equilibrium systems like molecular motors. So you can look at the work done on some particle system that where these stochastic quantities, these stochastic thermodynamic quantities have are random variables. So you look at distributions and you can find also large deviation principles into this. And then I'm going to mention this um, later on in the talk. It's also used a lot in engineering and statistics um, in filtering. In statistics, you can imagine, I mean, these are just estimators. So you want to obtain uh, bounds or distributions for estimators and see how they concentrate in some limit in the ergodic limit or in the large sample limit. So large deviation theory has been used a lot in statistics and information theory, engineering and queuing theory. For instance, you can look at probabilities of rare events like a queue occupation being larger than some number and so on. OK, so these are the general ideas. At this point, I'm just going to stop talking about the theory itself. And I want to discuss, I'll discuss applications in physics, starting with equilibrium. But the point I want to make here is to just uh, pause and just summarize what we've seen. Probabilities that decays exponentially, they're related to the fact that the generating function also behaves exponentially. And this is the relation, this is the basis for the duality between 
generating functions and rate functions. And I've mentioned this, the zeros of, of the rate function will be related to typical values. So this is related to the law of large number, the fact that the distribution concentrates exponentially. And if you expand the rate function, you get information about Gaussian small fluctuations around the concentration point. But in general, the rate function is not a parabola. And so it describes non-Gaussian fluctuations close and far away from the mean or the concentration point. And then you have that Legendre connection. Okay, so I'll start with the applications in physics with something that I think we all know, equilibrium system, just to show how we can basically rewrite equilibrium statistical mechanics in the language of large deviations. And so make connections with Boltzmann, make connections again with Einstein and this notion of, of entropy now being related to large deviation theory. So the, the framework is as we know it, we have n particles, and so specifying the state of each of these particles specifies the, mi the, the microstate. So this is the microscopic configuration. But of course, as observers or um, when you do measurements, you're not measuring the microscopic configurations, but you're measuring a macro state, which is some global observable of the system. Um, so we have that macro state, and so the goal is to get the distribution of the macro state given the underlying probabilistic model for your system, and then the probabilistic model would be a distribution over the microscopic configuration, and this is the notion of an ensemble. So given the ensemble, you want the distribution of the macro state. Of course, this is impossible, uh, very difficult to do, if not impossible. So what we're going to do instead is to try to find the uh, the large deviation principle associated with that distribution, extract the rate function, and out of this, just study the typical state of the system, the typical values of the macro state or what we call equilibrium states. And with the rate function, we can study fluctuations around equilibrium. And here, the large deviation limit is the thermodynamic limit. We take the size of the system or the number of particles going to infinity. Now, we can do this in many different contexts, and these physical contexts will just specify different probabilistic model for the system. So if I look at the system for a fixed energy, then I know I have to use the microcanonical ensemble, which says that the probability for each of the configuration is the same if they have the same energy. With this probabilistic model, I can calculate the probability for macro state, and I can do this for many different systems. And what I find is the large deviation principle. The probability will go down exponentially. And this is directly related to Einstein because Einstein just said that the probability is the exponential of the entropy, but we know that the entropy is extensive with the number of particles or their volume. So saying that the entropy is, is extensive is really saying that the approximate part of the distribution is an exponentially decaying exponential with the number of particles. So you see here the connection with Einstein. The only difference is that now we can derive this mathematically. We don't have to postulate this distribution. It comes from mathematics by applying the theory to get the distribution. Now here I'm not showing, of course, like a specific calculation, but you can do specific calculation for the different models that you can write down in equilibrium statistical mechanics. Now this is for if the energy is constant, if the temperature is constant, we have to use a different ensemble. So in this case, we have to use the Gibbs distribution for the microscopic configuration. This is the underlying probability model. With this, now I can calculate the distribution for the macro state as a function of the inverse temperature, and I'll get a large deviation principle in many, many cases. This also relates to what we already know in physics, because we know that from Landau, that probabilities are exponential with the free energy, but the free energy is extensive when the system becomes quite big. And so saying this, saying that the free energy is extensive is exactly the same as saying that the probability will follow a large deviation principle. But again, what we have now is slightly more because we have techniques to get the rate function. Then we get more connections that we already know. The zero of the rate function will be the equilibrium state. For the canonical ensemble, this means that the equilibrium state will maximize, will minimize the free energy, sorry, and that's just the same as saying that it minimizes the rate function. Whereas with the minus sign with the connection with the entropy, the equilibrium state which minimizes the rate function will maximize the entropy. And this is also what uh, Einstein actually knew already at, in 1910. So for equilibrium system, you don't really gain more. You just have a reinterpretation of stuff that we already knew. And, but um, 
Oh, no, I should backtrack on this. You do gain a lot. You, you do gain more because now you have conditions that will say under which conditions you expect those probabilities to be exponential. And they're basically the same as what we know in statistical mechanics is the existence of the free energy. So if the free energy exists, then that's the condition of the gartner ellis theorem, then you can get uh, 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 rate functions. There are more connections. You can, end, you can do an interpretation. You can come up with an interpretation of the entropy really as a rate function. You can show that the free energy is really that scale coulomb generating function. I'm going to jump over this. It's, uh, if you want more information, I'll give you a, a reference at the end. For the time that I have left, uh, what I want to do now is, is to show how we can apply exactly the same ideas for studying non-equilibrium system. And this is what's interesting for us now, people working in non-equilibrium system, because we're basically using the same language and we're using a common language now in the field, which makes it, I think, easier to work together and then come up with results. So here, it's a similar context in the sense that we have, we uh, studying a physical system, uh, non-equilibrium, now it's driven by external forces, maybe external reservoirs, you might be dealing with a one particle system or many interacting particles, a microscopic configuration in that case is a trajectory of the system in time, what you measure is not the trajectory itself, but some observable of that trajectory, so you have the same dichotomy of two levels, a microscopic level, if you want, which is the stochastic path of the system, and then a macroscopic level of the system, which is an observed uh, a measured observable, which is a function of the microscopic uh, system. So again, um, the reason why we're modeling this as a stochastic process, I mean, I can go into this for, for a long time, but it's, it's a convenience at the same time that it's physical subsystem, really non-equilibrium non system are inherently stochastic. In some cases, we, we model them as Markov processes because to some extent we can, um, they can be well approximated as Markov processes. And then as a last resort, it's also that we, we can do calculations if you model a physical system as a Markov process. Now, the problem is the same. We want to find the distribution of the observable. This is very difficult in general, if not impossible. So we'll go after the large deviation principle and the rate function. From the rate function, we'll get lots of information. The zeros of the rate function will correspond to the typical value of the observable. So we call them stationary states. With the rate function, we can also study fluctuations around that stationary states. And here, the large deviation limit can be a, a large volume limit, a long time observation limit, or a small noise limit. Um, or you can even mix these three now in different ways. Um, but but the, the formalism is, is, more, is, is the same in the sense that I have a large deviation principle for the observable. I'm just going to illustrate this with the simplest example, just a one-dimensional stochastic differential equation, which actually models something that's been measured in the lab. So if you know about laser tweezers, you probably know that you can put very small glass beads in water, like micro size, micron size beads, and then in water, they will undergo run in motion. So you can observe them using a, a good enough microscope, and then you can see that they undergo run in motions. This is actually a good experimental test of run in motion. Then what you can do is that you can shine counteracting lasers to form what we call a laser tweezers. And if the laser intensity is low enough, it's essentially like putting a, a linear force onto the system, onto the glass bead. So it's basically like attaching a spring onto the bead. And then you can start manipulating the bead using these lasers, but the system is still stochastic because of the interaction with the surrounding water. So what you would use as a model is a stochastic differential equation. So this is basically Newton's equation where you have the stoke friction with the water. This is the laser force, which is a linear force. And then you have the noise that's Brownian, that's Gaussian white noise, and that comes also from water. So you have a stochastic model. This is a Markov model. And then what you start doing is that you have now an observable, which could be, say, the work that you, the laser does on the particle or the heat exchange between the particle and the environment. And these are random variables because the system is under is stochastic, then these are random variables. So if you want to get the distribution, you can try to get the exact distribution, but this is very difficult. What we know is that they follow a large deviation principle and you can calculate the rate function in this case. For Markov processes, I haven't mentioned this, but the calculation of a rate function is related to a spectral problem. So it's a bit like quantum mechanics. You need to solve a spectral problem, and this will give you the rate function. 
Okay, so this is for one particle system. You see the idea, you need to come up with a stochastic model, then you have some kind of macro variable, which is an observable, and the goal is to get the rate function associated with that observable, and then that rate function will give you some information. For instance, if you heard about fluctuation relation for the entropy production, they're related to a symmetry of the rate function. So it's related to large deviation theory. So this has been applied in recent years quite a lot beyond one particle model, for instance, for many interacting particles that are evolving on lattices. And these models are taken, they use as models of particle transport. So the, the, the holy grail of non-equilibrium statistical mechanics is to, is to explain current um, between reservoirs at different temperature or reservoir with different chemical potential. So amazingly, it's quite difficult actually to study this kind of system, even though it's very common. And so people have attacked the problem in different ways. And one way to do this is to model the whole dynamics at a macroscopic level using interacting Markov processes. So here you would have the state of the Markov processes, it's the state of each particle. You can include interactions between the particle, you can include exclusion interactions or even interactions between particles. This will define the Markov process. You can define some kind of observable and then study large deviations. And you can take a kind of large size limit, which will correspond to a thermodynamic limit, and then you get large deviations in that case. You can follow also a more phenomenological approach where you try to model this already at a macro state level, at a macroscopic level rather, or at kind of um, hydrodynamic level as a stochastic field theory. And so you can start already with some conservation equations in which you add noise, and then you can derive large deviation principle for uh, these for quantities related to that system, like the density, the random density, or the random current that's being established in this. Uh, so this is basically like a kind of fluctuating field theory around microscopic evolutions that describe uh, energy or particle transport. So that's been studied a lot, and this is related to what people call microscopic fluctuation theory. Okay, so there, there, there are a lot more applications. I think I'm, I'm close to finishing here. Um, here I'm just putting some pictures at random about applications. You can ask me questions about the specific ways in which we study these systems. So they're basically in physics right now and statistical mechanics, people using large deviation theory are studying two lines. One is the obvious line of applying the theory to study many different systems. So they could be complex systems like random graphs. So for instance, um, Isaac actually studies uh, random graphs using uh, large deviation theory. So looking at typical properties of random graphs versus fluctuation fluctuations of these properties around these typical properties. So you can use large deviations for doing this. You also have probabilities that behave exponentially with the size of the graph. You can also look at random walks on random graph, and this will be more in the line of doing um, large deviations for Markov processes. People have also looked at glassy systems. For instance, Juan Pe is very active on that front. Quantum system, glassy systems, like interacting particles with Leonard Jones um, uh, uh, interactions. Here I'm showing actually this picture at the bottom right is directly from a paper of, of Juan, Juan Pe, Juan Garan, on the activity of, of glassy systems. So this is a Leonard Jones like uh, system um, in which they can measure the activity um, and then relate this to a glassy transition. And the distribution of the activity has a large deviation uh, form. Uh, people have also looked recently at bistability and turbulence, temperature fluctuations in the atmosphere using very reduced models. Um, and this goes in the line of many applications of large deviation theory for non-equilibrium systems. So systems that are driven away from equilibrium by external forces or reservoirs or non-conservative forces. And then another line of work which is very active is simulation. So developing simulation methods for large deviation theory, because as you can imagine, and as always with physics, there's only uh, very few systems that we can study analytically. Um, and so we need numerical methods to estimate rate functions, calculate very small probabilities. And this is an amazing challenge that's actually faced in many different fields of science, engineering, statistics. And so people have come up with different methods for, for estimating rate functions and estimating large deviation 
in general. And so you, uh, here I'm listing some three methods, splitting, which is more or less the same as cloning. You have also important sampling. And more recently, people have started looking at control methods and neural networks, so using machine learning methods to do sampling of, of rare events and estimation of rate functions. So Juan, for instance, also is working on this. Uh, there are other people working on this from a physics point of view, but also in, in mathematics or in applied mathematics. So this is very, very active at the moment and quite exciting. Um, so this is the last slide. Um, here I'm giving some references if you want to know more. Actually, a lot of what I've said is from my physics reports of when I was a postdoc at Queen Mary. Unfortunately, it's a bit old now, so I wish I could update this, but it's probably a better idea to write a book now rather than updating a physics report. Um, I also have lecture notes and links for videos if you want or, or teaching that I do on rash deviation on my website, so you have the address there. And I'll just finish by saying that for me, large deviation theory was something very useful when I was a student because I could see more similarities using that language, especially between equilibrium and non-equilibrium. And here what I'm showing is a kind of dictionary between equilibrium concepts that we know and non-equilibrium concepts and then showing the relationship, for instance, entropy being a rate function and free energy being a scale clean generating function. So for me, I see this as a, a language, a unifying language for statistical physics. Now this side, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Hugo, very much for this very, very interesting talk, very clear, very useful for, uh, for people that they do not know this area and also for students who got, uh, might get very excited to, to the possibility to do research. So, uh, so first of all, I would like everybody to thank uh, Hugo for this fantastic talk. Thank you, Hugo, very much. Thank you. And uh, now, if there are some questions, there are two ways to do it. Uh, colleagues, either you ask directly uh, to Hugo, just uh, activate the microphone, or if you, can, if, or if you want, you can write it on the chat and I'll, I'll read it. Uh, Hugo, uh, Juanpe uh, just said in the, on the chat that unfortunately he has to, he has to, he has to leave, okay? He, he actually, he just uh, left. So yes, he, yes. Said, he sends his greetings and, uh, and many hugs. Good, I can see this. Any questions, guys? Uh, well, I have one. Actually, I have many, <laughs> but I want to ask you uh, one. At the beginning of your of your talk, you mentioned that uh, large deviation theory is not a universal theory. Can you yes. uh, can you uh, can you go more into the detail of what you mean precisely? Because normally, when uh, in certain areas, and I've done this thing particularly when we use large deviation theories, somehow to try to unveil some some sort of universal properties in certain systems right yeah well i, I think it actually relates to your other question you ask what if the, the probability is not exponential so it, large deviation theory is, a, is is not a universal theory in the sense that you know you can have distributions that are not captured by the large deviation principle what i would say is that the theory is quite general because it gives conditions under which you you can get the large deviation principle and then if you're studying especially like Markov processes, then you see these large deviation principle or approximation appearing time and time and again. So it, it, it's quite general, but it's for sure it's not, a, it's not universal. Then if you go to physics, uh, for equilibrium statistical mechanics, it seems clear, but it's never been proven that probabilities are always exponential. If, if, if thermodynamic exists, if you have the existence of thermodynamic potentials, then it automatically implies that everything is exponential with the number of particles of volume. And again, you, 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 you might have Constantino Tzalis saying something else, but it, you know, this, this is a, there's a lot of controversy and, and, and discussions around this, and it's, it's never been settled. And then from my own point of view, equilibrium at least is, is universally exponential, uh, and it's just based on the existence of thermodynamic potentials. The way they are defined actually shows that everything is exponential. Then for non-equilibrium, that's not so clear. Um, and there are many cases and many things, many systems you can devise where you know, by construction, you're not going to get probabilities that are exponential. And so it's, it's sure. not a universal theory. It, it, not all of physics uh, is exponential. And, and this see. is fine. It's, uh, it's, so, so, so it's when you say, yeah. yeah, so, so, yeah, just for, uh, if, if I understand, uh, let me see if I understand you correctly. Just from the point of view of applicability of large division theory, it's not yeah. universal. But yeah. when you apply it to a given systems, you can study the universal properties of random variables. Oh, right? yes, yes, yes. Yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. 
very good. So actually, without, uh, I'm not sure whether uh, if colleagues have some questions, please go ahead or uh, uh, raise your hands. So let me see if somebody has raised their hand so I can see it. So actually, if I can, if I, if I'm allowed to be a bit controversial, not for me, uh, you, you mentioned the work of Constantino Thales, okay, mm -hmm. about uh, non-extensive uh, thermodynamics, okay. Yeah. Uh, can you give us, because you are an, an, an expert in large division theory, okay, you have done an amazing work. So wh what what is your take, generally speaking, of non-extensive non, non uh, thermodynamics? Is it useful? Is it not useful? Can be applied to certain cases? Uh, mm. it's, it's funny, actually, because I, I came to learn large deviations because of Constantino. Um, I, I, when I was a master student, I saw a talk of his and I was really excited by all this and I, I thought, okay, it would be nice to do some mathematical work on this and I was trying to find a good formalism for, you know, working in statistical mechanics if, in the mathematical way and then I discovered large deviations, but then the more I started reading on, on extensive statistical mechanics, then the more you realize that there's not much to it. It's, there's, a, there's a lot of formalism, but really no direct application, no um, direct observation, again, contrary to what is claimed. So, and then it becomes a very draining work actually to get involved in this and criticizing or trying to sure. the constructive criticism of, of the field. So in a way, I, I just drew myself out of that discussion and then tried to work on something else. And that actually led me to working in large deviations, looking at equivalence of ensembles and then random graphs and Really, it's that that's how, that's how I started working as as a researcher in large deviation theory, but in large deviation theory per se, like in, in statistical physics, completely away from non extensive statistical mechanics. So now non -ex non extensive is kind of a closed world. There's there's some people working on this, mm -hmm. um, but um, again, I I don't know. It's a uh, it's very difficult also to criticize without being hit back personally. So again, it's very yeah. draining personally sure, to sure. work on this. Uh, I understand. Some people might have that experience already. And, uh, well, I, I think that people have uh, this experience in many areas, no? I mean, maybe yeah, some no, it is, it is, <laughs> more than others. Yeah, so actually... It's not specific to that, that field, uh, but yeah. Um, yeah, I, I had my, my share of interaction with Constantino and uh, at conferences. I, I went to many conferences. And I met lots of people actually I work with even now um, from these conferences and, and by interacting in that field. So I have some experience with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I, I think that uh, some of ideas, it seems to be, uh, they, at least physically, they seem to be okay. Like, for instance, when you have a distribution where uh, you have a given temperature and then the temperature you assume that follows a given distribution, you know, some, some work on spin glasses, when you have replica mm -hmm. symmetry breaking, this can yeah. be understood as, a, as, you know, the system coupled to a, to a scale of, of temperature, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, this, yeah. this is probably like the more serious line of work that they had, which is called super statistics, where you look at the systems That's that have local variation of fluctuations of temperature, but then you need, in order to get the Q exponential that, that Constantin Tomotelis is, is pushing forward, like that very specific Q exponential form, you need to assume a very specific form, very specific, specific form of the temperature fluctuation sure. in order to obtain by convolution that Q exponential. So it's a nice result, but I wouldn't say that it's, a, it's any general. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, okay, uh, what about, uh, actually... But now this is... <laughs> You're asking me those questions, but I didn't realize this is on YouTube recorded and so Constantine will <laughs> yes, be watching I, this and then... I, th I think it's fine, I think it's fine. <laughs> uh, I, I, th I think, listen, I think it's part of science. I mean, uh, yes, I have a uh, okay. healthy debate. I, I think it's absolutely fine, okay? Well, at so, least I, I, could, I, I, could, I could say to my own defense that this is my personal opinion and so I'm not voicing a, a general opinion of the field or anything. What I would say is that there is a controversy in the field and so people have to be aware of this. So actually, actually I can tell you that when I was doing my PhD in Belgium, and then we will we I'll go back to large division theory. But when I was doing my PhD in Belgium, I was working now with a guy there on a on a, on a work on a paper. I think about about with a, of Christian Beck. I think who was uh, mm, no. Right? So I was supposed like also with Christian at the time. That's where I went. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's why. Yeah, uh, I understand. I, I I got that 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 was the connection. And I look at the paper, and my my colleague at the time, he was also doing the 
actually the PhD with Christian Myers, who, who, who I think you know, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I will look at the paper, and, and for me, it's like, uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't see any sense on, uh, on, on that paper, and actually, and, uh, mm -hmm. and the resource that they got, it was, it, 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 it was very, uh, very clear. But I, in any case, I, okay. We can discuss it in another. So, I, <laughs> so, I mean, so going, a well-watched uh, YouTube video now for the controversy more than the introduction to large deviation. I think it's fine. I, I don't care, quite frankly. <laughs> so going back to large deviation, okay. Yeah. You have mentioned that uh, there, there are applications of, of quantum systems. I know there have been applications, okay. And I think this is a very, very exciting uh, area of, of research. What, but what, what is people currently doing in quantum systems, particularly. I, I know that uh, Cecile Montu, if I recall correctly, maybe, maybe she's working on that. Yes, yeah, working on disordered system. Actually, there was some work originally by Lebovitz. I think he had a, su a student in the 90s, early 2000, working on quantum spins. Um, people have looked also at large deviations for something they call the Lutschmidt echo, so non-equilibrium yeah, yeah. E echo dynamics. Um, there's lots of different, yeah, also um, quantum particle transport. So there's some work in Paris actually um, on this. Uh, Juan also actually works on this. He works at quantum systems that are modeled using jump processes. So you have um, these projection operators. So you have kind of Lindblad equation type uh, description yeah. of open quantum systems. So he looked at large deviation. I would say like Juan is super active actually. On, on these applications, quantum applications, but also in terms of simulation methods for large deviations and so on. Mm -hmm. okay. but there's, there's lots of work actually in quantum. I would say it's a kind of, it's a busy, busy field at the moment, this, this intersection of large deviation and quantum systems. Oh, I see, very good. So let me see if there is something in the chat. So any other questions, colleagues? So if not, uh, Hugo, I, once, once more, thank you very much for being here. Okay, I thank you very much for this fantastic uh, seminar. And for the rest, uh, let me remind you that tomorrow, actually we have a special event to celebrate the, the Nobel Prize of, uh, of Giorgio Parisi. Okay, we're going to have, a, I'm going to give a, a small seminar and then we're going to have a, our own a, a, a round table to discuss about, you know, complexity science in Mexico. Okay, so I hope you can, uh, you can always stay stay there tomorrow okay and also next week we'll continue with brian kitty all right so thank you very much guys see you thank you, thank you. isaac thank you very much hugo that was a very thank nice you. talk thank you goodbye yeah, goodbye bye bye